Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the True Life Podcast. We are here with the one and only Kevin Holt. He is the author of at least one book that I know about. He's got some courses on breath work. He's traveled around the world. He's a Swiss citizen, but he's not a stranger to the United States of America. Anything's Vegas is kind of crazy. So let's <laughs> chit chat with him a little bit and see what we got going. Kevin, how are you, my friend? What's new? I'm well, and welcome to George's show. George Monty is a podcaster extraordinaire, excellent interviewer, and author himself. So thank you for having me on the show once again, Mr. George Monty. Ah, the um, pleasure's all mine. Yeah, good. Uh, it's been a, an interesting week. Um, we've sort of decided that I need to do a lot more social media. So I'm going to be doing a lot more social media. So anybody that's on my social media, you're going to see a lot more stuff. Yeah. So that's a, that's its own whole puzzle to figure out. Now, I don't know anybody listening, whoever is an aspiring artist or writer um, like myself. One thing I've realized is that the writing isn't actually the hard part. So it's easy. It's hard. You have to get re over resistance to actually finish the work. But then now you have something. Now I've got a book. Now the challenge is how do you get people to read it? And I put in my head a number. I want 10,000 people to read it. I've got about 200 something right now. But the, here's the conundrum in that I personally, and maybe other people do who are writers, I tend to be introverted, let's say. I enjoy my privacy. I have no desire whatsoever to be famous or be on magazine covers or anything like that. But Unless people know who I am, how are they going to find out about my book and read it? So that's what I've been sort of battling with and trying to puzzle out what I need to do to get there. You're preaching to the choir. You know, I, I, it's a blessing and a curse because right now it is possible for you to have, to be on a podcast, to start your own podcast, to do your own marketing. On that level, it's a blessing. But on another level, it's a curse because you have to do your own marketing. You have to go on your own podcast and you have to do it. You, you can, and you're kind of a prisoner to that. We don't have the machine that is the big business model. You don't have something you can just plug right into and, and go about it that way. What, when you say you're going to be doing a lot more, what kind of strategies do you have or what have you thought about doing? Well, I'm on the usual channels. I'm on LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn I've had the most success with because it was my professional network. And I think more people know me personally than in the other ones where I have a lot of strangers following me maybe. So I'm on LinkedIn, Instagram. I have an interesting story about Facebook, actually. I, I've been sort of shadow banned from Facebook. And I found this out last week. And... The reason I found this out is because I wanted to run another another ad campaign for my book. And I did one a couple of years ago, got a few sales off of it, learned some things, and then just sort of dropped it. I don't know why I dropped it, but I just decided not to do it because there were some issues with the platform I was using and I needed to rework it. And then I just put it aside and sort of forgot about it and then got busy with other things. So then when I went back into my account, and this is typical Facebook for anybody that's wants to do social media ads with Facebook. This kind of stuff happens all the time. The account, well, it's basically you have an account that's tied to a page and you use the page to run ads. They said my page was restricted from advertising since the 20th of December, 2020. And I was, I think I was running ads maybe three or four months before that the last time. And I had not run a single ad since then. So I was trying to think, Okay, what, what, like, why would they do that? And then I looked at the page where it says account quality and it shows what violations you may have, but there were none. There was nothing listed. And then the other thing I looked at about account standards said that my page was in good working order and there were no issues with it. So I appealed the restriction and all I asked them was to clarify. Right. It said it, it didn't even tell me what I did wrong. It just said there's some violation. So I said, I just want to know what I did wrong so I can fix it. And you can't ever talk to anybody at Facebook. You just do this generic yeah. uh, request. Yeah. And then it came back not even a day later. And it said, we've reviewed your case. We've permanently banned you from advertising. This is our final decision. No explanation. 
So I'm going, all right, well, that stinks because I only really want Facebook to run ads because otherwise there's not a whole lot of value add other than as an address book. So I'm trying to think like, what could I have done? And the only thing that comes to mind was around this time of December, 2020, I created a lengthy post of all that I could research about the COVID vaccines that was available at the time. It hadn't been rolled out yet. I think maybe first responders in the US got it in December, but it wasn't even really rolled out till January, 2021. But once, once it was coming out and the studies were out, I researched it as much as I could. I want to know what was going on. And I wrote this long post. It was referenced. I had links to articles with scientists and all, like as many sources as I could find. And I said, based on my research, the vast majority of people probably shouldn't take this thing because unless you have a pre-existing condition or you're a risk group, the cost benefit ratio uh, doesn't necessarily work out because of all the unknowns. Uh, that at that time, we like we didn't really know anything that hadn't, hadn't rolled out yet. And it was a long thing. And I think that's the only thing I can think of that might have flagged my account stealthily like that. So, yeah, so I had to delete my account. Now I'm starting all over from scratch with that. <laughs> yeah, that was huge. There was a, I mean, you're not the only one. I think it was there was a really. A really. What's the word I'm thinking for? A really tight knit case of people coming together and making sure certain things that was like a really overreaching arm of censorship that came out and really pushed all that information down. And it was it was fascinating in a way to see the level of coordination that took place. And mm -hmm. you know, we hear we hear and we think about you know large companies competing against one another but this was a case of them working together with one another to make sure that there was a narrative in place and maybe you know i guess it could be argued that people thought they were acting in the name of of good faith and you know people's health you know i i don't agree with that i i think that there should be a robust conversation and debate about anything that's going to be rolled out in healthcare. However, I, that seems to be the, if I was going to steal man, if that's what I would say they were doing, but yeah, I, I, I think that that's very plausible. You could have been shadow banned or completely banned or lost your account for that. Yeah. My friend said, he, he's like, you don't have the social credit to be able to do business. I said, that's probably <laughs> what happened because they let yeah. me keep my account. I could still post and everything. I just couldn't advertise. And my yeah. page didn't do anything. My, my page was posting yoga videos and stuff like that. There was no political stuff at all on the page itself. So it's the only thing that it could have been. But, so what was interesting is I deleted everything and then I started over with a new account and I made a new page. And within five minutes of me making the page, they took it down. Mm. And all I had put was a photo. And they said I violated the community guidelines, which is stuff like sexual harassment and all these things. Yeah. I mean, I just put, put a photo of my face. That's all I posted. Well, I appealed that and then they actually realized that they made a mistake. So I guess sometimes they do judge in your favor. But yeah, so now they put it back up and now I'm going again. And I just started this ad campaign just to see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Go ahead, sorry. No, it's all good. I just I've I've used I've used Facebook to um promote my podcast on sometimes and it's 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 pretty detailed. And one thing that kind of amazes me about it, and one thing that I've one thing that I really enjoyed, but it was also somewhat scary to me, was um, the way you can target audiences on Facebook. Like you can pick, you know, pick your age group between 10 and 70. And you could put in there, I want someone who is likes science, who studies grammar, logic, and rhetoric, um, and black Nikes, and biological warfare. You know, and you can, you can just target audience. And as I'm, as I'm targeting my audience, I start thinking of the way in which we describe advertising as a target audience. Like what else do you use yeah. a target for? Like a gun, a weapon and social media advertising. You could argue that advertising, especially the ads, and I'm guilty of it for running them. They are like a weapon. If you can design a really good ad, then you could penetrate the skin you can penetrate people's minds and get in their head it's 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 an incredible type of of weapon and it just it blows my mind to think about what the language we use 
explicitly explains what we're doing. That, that's amazing to me. And Facebook's really, really good at targeting people. Yeah, and you can do all kinds of funky stuff. You can also retarget them. And then it's anybody that clicked or liked or followed you within a certain amount of time. And then you can create all these funky lookalike audiences. Yep. You can find people that look like people that like your stuff. It's, it's quite, yeah, it's quite elaborate. And uh, there is sort of like a almost dirty feeling to it sometimes when, <laughs> when you're doing it. You're like, okay, these people are, I've got so much information on, or I don't have it, but Facebook has it. Yeah. And a lot of marketing is fear manipulation. Yep. So part of it is how do I market this in a way that I find is ethical and that I'm comfortable with? And that's not necessarily an easy thing to piece together. And it's also people do it because it works. Yeah. They, they know that hitting those emotional triggers, the fear, the things that you wish you had and don't, that's what sells things. So I, I struggle with that sometimes trying to find that balance. Yeah. I, for everybody listening, I would recommend that you go on Facebook and you sign up for a page and you play with these tools because once you begin either running an ad or just doing like an ad mock-up, you'll really begin to understand. Like if you can be, if you can begin to understand how to target your own audience, then you will understand how you have become a target and you'll understand which boxes that you're in. Oh, I'm like a 47 year old white guy that listens to these things. I would probably be on this person's list. And then once you do that, you start seeing the ads in your in your stream, be it on Instagram or Facebook, and things will start clicking. You'd be like, oh, wow, that's that's a trip. I see why these ads are targeted to me. Like I'm being targeted car seats and you know a, a Tacoma truck, and I, I have you hit all these boxes. So you can see the machine working. And Facebook will allow you to take a tour behind the scenes. It's like it's like going to Disneyland and getting to watch the these shows behind the scenes and everybody can do it. You can go on Facebook and you can see the tools. You can see the machine. You can grab the levers and pull them. And it's, it's fascinating if you look at it from that aspect. And I recommend that everybody does it. Kevin, I got a question for you from our, from one of our guests here. So okay. here is, here's our, let me try to see if I can put it up here. Okay. So this, our good friend, true Patriots, this guy's pretty awesome. He's been coming to all the shows and asking questions. Here's what oh, he's got sweet. for you. He wants to know, what is your book about, my friend? Uh, the book is about the journey that I went through when I was miserable at my highly paid, successful, high-flying job, and I didn't understand why I was miserable. And so I went on this quest for information, trying to figure out what makes me tick, what the human needs are and emotions are, and what is happiness, and what's what are the keys to making yourself feel better, freer, happier, and create the life that you want. And over that course of time, I learned a few things and I put it into a narrative, which is this book. And it's sort of a little bit about what I went through and then offering the strategies that worked for me to the reader. That's in a nutshell what it is. Thank you for asking, by the way. Yeah. And just yeah. For, for, so for people listening, one thing that was awesome about your book amongst many was that there's a lot of cool exercises that you put in there for people to do. So it's not only a narrative and it's not only a story that you can read and maybe find yourself in. It's also chock full of different like self-authoring type courses and, <clears throat> and activities that you can do. My question is, are those all things that you did that got you to maybe see the world more clear? Yeah, for sure. I believe that writing is the most powerful tool to any kind of self-knowledge. So that's why I put those exercises in there. That's, they're not big enough to do in the book necessarily, but if you have a separate piece of paper, you can just write this stuff out, you know, and one of them is, is draw a circle of the zones of your life. Like how would you divide your life into different parts? And then maybe there are four or five or six different ones. And then you can look at each one individually and go, well, how happy am I in this part? What needs in this area of my life are not being met? And how can I get them? So that's one exercise. And there's probably four or five like that, where you can list out, for, for example, your beliefs, which beliefs I have, what do they lead to? And what decisions have they made to? Which ones aren't necessarily working for me, for me anymore? Which And which can I change? Because we can change beliefs. People yeah. think that they're static. They're actually not. I mean, a belief is just another layer of the ego like anything else that you can strip away and reconstruct with something 
that serves you more. So yeah, thank you for, for bringing up the exercises. So that's probably the most powerful thing you can do while, while reading the book is actually do the exercises. Yeah, I, I feel like it's a one-two combo. You know, it's one thing to read about something, but it's another thing to participate in that very thing. It's like getting to see yourself from multiple angles or getting to see a conversation from multiple angles. And another thing I have found, you can use those same, like you could just play around with that exercise and go with the three circles and then maybe change it into like a Venn diagram and find out, you know what, I'm happy with my relationships and I'm happy with this person I'm with, but I'm not really happy where we're at. And you could see, you could play with all of them and it's, it's, it's powerful. Just, it's almost like you're allowing people people to borrow the imagery of your mind as a tool and handing it to them yeah you know and like hey here's this wrench try this oh you got a plumbing problem here try this pipe wrench this is the one i use so that's that's the way that's one another reason why i i found it to be not only interesting but unique that way like you don't see too many too many people that are coaches that want to help people have the ability to express themselves in two ways at once. And that's what, that's, that's kind of what the book was, you know, it was a, it was a multi-layered pipe wrench. <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and most of the stuff I, I didn't invent, right. I mean, some of them right. I did, but most of them don't just take me from elsewhere. And I tried to put as much as I could in a small space. Cause it's not yeah. very long. I think it's like 130 or 140 pages. You can probably read it in three hours, but I, a lot of the books I read like that, they either don't have ex exercises like that or they're too long and or they're four or 500 pages long. And you're just, and it maybe it motivates you. It pumps you up. But I feel like one of the problems with self-development and personal development is people spend too much time on personal development. You know, just reading books, long books, and you read the yeah. next book, you read the next book. My idea is like, here's a short book, read it real quick and then go do stuff. Cause it's in the doing of the stuff that you make change. So that's why it's, it's not very long. Yeah. All right, so here's the, this guy is just, he is setting them up so you can knock them down. Look, look at this one right here. Here you go. Sweet. What's the name oh, of the book? Yeah. Where can you order at? All right, name of the book is called Young, Successful, and Miserable. A, I don't remember the subtitle. A Guide to Getting More Freedom or something like that. I forgot the subtitle. It's long. But Young, Successful, and Miserable. If you go to kevinholtbook.com, you can get the digital and audiobook versions and it's cheaper there i think it's like five bucks there but if you if you want paperback i can only offer it through amazon so if you go on amazon you'll find it there but it'll and be it, more expensive than plus shipping yeah i heard that there's a rumor going around if they go to your website you might sign a book for them do you have the ability to do that work. okay <laughs> well then uh, don't, don't listen to that rumor then <laughs> i have to order it first and then mail it to you i mean i suppose i suppose we could figure that out yeah <laughs> look at me making all these offers i can't even back up but i'll, yeah. I'll put I, I'll I wish put, there was a way to do that like easily yeah i'll put all the links in the show notes too so uh our friend true patriots over here can uh can actually get a copy of it and, yeah cool uh, thanks thanks true patriot yeah. for the questions yeah absolutely man he's a he's yeah. a he's one of us it seems like <laughs> yeah it's good to find your people it's it's you know they're out there and they're making it hard harder to find them but you know you got to find your tribe yeah and I, I think the more you begin talking to people the more you begin understanding that we're all on a journey and we we're either going into a storm or in a storm or coming out of a storm no matter where you are in life and there's good tools for all three of those particular situations and we all go through them so Depending where you are on the journey, it's nice to have a cool toolkit to fix these things. And I, I would I would recommend to everybody that keeping a journal is a phenomenal way of keeping your way in life. Why, why do you think about it? earlier? You spoke about how writing something is one of the best ways to help maintain your course or keep your your keep you on the straight and narrow. Why do you think that is? It's just it's just the best way to focus your thinking when you write it out because you were talking before about having a lot of things going on in, yeah. in your head for you that works but right. for a lot of people it doesn't work and it's just you have a constant distraction and you're always going real quickly down all these different tangents but when you sit down and you try to focus and you try to stay on topic through writing i think that's how you get the most clarity 
and you got to keep doing it like every day, a little bit, a little bit, you know, 10, 20 minutes a day. If you have a specific topic or if you just want to free write, I think it's, it's all, it's all good. Yeah, I agree. I, th I think there's something um, not just romantic about it, but there's something about it that the, the way you like, if you write something, it feels different than thinking about it. It's almost like when you write something, your body, it's like this. When you talk about it, it's a dream. When you envision it, it's possible. But when you schedule it, it becomes real. And mm -hmm. all day long, we're talking about it and thinking about it. But when you write it down, like you've actually transitioned the, you you have you have translated vision into reality just by writing right. it first, down. I was going to say the exact same thing. It's the first step of yes. making a thought real because now it's there and hey someone could chance upon your note and then they they have the thought and then it's already being shared somehow so yeah it's exactly that yeah and and, and also yeah. also it's said i don't know how true this is but when you and this is also also where writing is better than typing because mm -hmm. when you're typing you're only using certain movements apparently when you're writing you're using more muscle movements in your hands and your arm and that is helping you create the neural pathway of the thing that you're writing about. Oh. And that's why they say that writing affirmations is also helpful because there's an example. I think I put in the book too. There's, um, uh, and it, there was an interview with the creator of the Dilbert comic, Scott Adams, mm -hmm. on Tim Ferriss's podcast. And he said he uses affirmations, written affirmations, as the secret to all his success. And he said there's nothing that he has tried to achieve through affirmations that hasn't happened. It's only happened not yet. So he literally, he, he decides he wants something. He writes it out in a sentence and he writes it at least 15 times by hand every single day. And perhaps there's something to that repetition of the words being manifested in a physical movement. That's maybe there's a connection there between the brain and the body that makes it stick. Yeah, I would agree. It's like your body is giving your brain permission or your brain is giving your body permission to manifest it. Like you said, it's the first step in creating it. Like you've thought about it. Now it's on paper. Now you just got to do it. It's got to follow the instructions now. Yeah. So that's one tool. There are basically two tools, I think, that are mm -hmm. essential to anybody that's on this journey of betterment, if you want to call it that. Yeah. The writing, the other one, breathing. Mm. Most people breathe wrong, and I was spent my whole life not knowing anything about the breathing. People who are, you know, stressed out and anxious all the time, they're not consciously aware of the fact that their breathing is contributing to that. So when we breathe shallow and quick and shallow, it actually triggers the flight or fight response in the body, which is creating stressors. And so the key is to breathe deeper through the abdomen and longer and extend the breath every time, a little more, a little more every time. And that's also going to keep you relaxed. And the more relaxed you are, the more your mind opens up and then you can get rid of these thoughts that are just cluttering and not helping you. And you can allow the, the ideas that will help you to come in. So I'm really passionate about breathing as well. So I've got, um, I've got a, long course on my website and i've also got a free telegram group where i do once a week i do a free um breathing session yeah nice what what does that look like what like if someone signed up for your free breathing course can you walk us through what that would look like well it's a group on the telegram app and i just do a live um, 20 30 minutes right now i'm just doing it once a week right and all i have to, all they need to do is show up and lay down super easy no experience required and uh, we usually, I usually do the Wim Hof technique. Sometimes I mix it up, but that's the easiest one to learn and one of the most effective ones. So we practice that. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing what what effects you can see and how it can change the way you fundamentally think about yourself or just about life or just maybe just change the way you think by changing the breath you use. And it goes back all the way to a lot of sacred texts they talk about breathing. Yeah. 
And there, people don't uh, necessarily know this or may not believe this, but there are some breathing techniques out there that are just as good as a psychedelic drug. Mm. And I didn't believe it at first either. There is a technique called the holotropic breath that I think it was five years ago I did it for the first time. And I went into it pretty skeptical, but it's very powerful. Really, it's it's intense too. It's like three hours of breathing. Yeah, that's. The, I, what's that uh, guy's name? What's that guy's name that that um? Stan Groff. Stan Groff. Yes. Yes. I'm, he's in I'm, his 80s now, I think. I'm sorry. He's in his 80s now, and he's. I think he's still like doing sessions and traveling and talking. It's got to be something to do with the breath, you know. They and I think that that's Rick Doblin's mentor, the guy who pretty much runs Maps. I think that that was oh, his really? mentor back in the day. Yeah, well, yeah. probably still is. It's it's interesting. Here in Hawaii, we have um, there's a the Polynesian Cultural Center, and they had this. They have this ongoing sort of cultural play that they do. I, I don't think play is the right word, but a presentation that they do, and it's called Ha, the Breath of Life. And it's just amazing when you start thinking about how breath and breath work fundamentally run through a lot of indigenous cultures. And it's a huge part of a lot of different cultures, but it's something that in the West we've decided isn't that important. It's weird how we've kind of gotten there. There's another technique from Hawaii. The, the name's escaping me right now, but it's sort of a meditation technique where they say to look at a certain part of the ceiling and expand your your field of vision mm. it's like you, you're supposed to look slightly up like look at the if you i'm trying to do it right now on camera but it's like if you look ahead but you move your eyes sort of to maybe like seven eighths of the way up up the field of vision forward and then you expand it to the sides mm. i'll have to look it up later but it's it's definitely hawaiian in origin there's a hawaiian word for that that's yeah, also I a great way, like a cool way to just relax your mind. Just you practice that and do it for a minute or two and it's already settles it. It's very effective. Yeah, that sounds like it. I would, I'm anxious to read more about that. I, I think there's, and that gets us back to the same way that writing helps you translate your vision into reality, the, you know, quieting your mind, be it through breath or through some sort of optic view is another way of just training your mind to, to act as one, like the body and mind working together in, in, in harmony, I think is a huge part of becoming a better you. Yeah. Uh, that's, I was, I've been on the yoga path for a few years now and it's, it's been really transformative for me mm -hmm. in terms of reducing basically the quantity of thinking mm -hmm. and I have way less clutter thoughts and what's in, the other thing is interesting actually is if we tie this if we tie this back into psychedelics yeah i've had this experience multiple times mainly on mushrooms where there is a there is a frequency of sound that is in line with what i'm thinking and mm. it's like when i'm thinking fearful you know sometimes during a trip you might be afraid yeah and when i have a fearful thought it's like here on the vibrational scale. And then as I change it to maybe happiness, it goes up, it gets higher in pitch. And then if I'm feeling love and joy, it gets even high, like very high. But the highest was no thinking, hmm. which I found very interesting. So the combination of, well, it could be other uh, drugs, but uh, magic mushrooms and meditation yeah. is very interesting. So I've done that before. I just take mushrooms and I just meditate for like two hours and I have that yeah. experience. And there's a guy, I don't remember his name. I think it's something Osborne, something James Osborne, maybe. I don't know if he's still doing this, but he used to host retreats in Jamaica. And I think his website is called Myco Meditation. And he does exactly this because in Jamaica, mushrooms are legal. So he invites people down there for a few days or a week in groups to, to do that, to meditate on mushrooms. Wow. Yeah, but you, it's incredibly rewarding. I, I think there's something to be said about vibrations and thought and sound. And I don't have the book in front of me, but I think there's multiple authors who have wrote about the world as vibration. And if, if we can see, yeah. you know, if you can see, I, I got this cool magnet that's like a 
uh, rare earth neodymium magnet, super powerful. <clears throat> and you can hold up like a, a, a green, I have a green magnetic sheet and you can kind of see the waves on it. And I always thought to wow. myself, like, dude, what if I got really just took a huge dose of mushrooms? And if we, and if, if, if a lot of the scientists who claim that everything is vibration, might it be possible to see those vibrations? Because you, it seems like your eyes get so dilated. The pupils become so big sometimes on mushrooms that you're open to so much. In, and that's what gives you the idea of things breathing, right? Like if the floor is breathing or a tree is breathing and it's kind of coming in and out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? Is that is that is that an illusion or is, are you seeing more of the world around you because you have more light coming in? So my thought was, if I could, what if I could just hold up this yeah. green sheet and look through it and see things vibrating? Maybe that's what you see when you're high on mushrooms. It's like you see the vibrations because it, it's when you see things breathing, be it the room, a tree, a dog, or your hand, like that's a vibration, right? It's like it's vibrating at a slower level. So maybe you're seeing the vibrations when you're in an altered state of consciousness. And if that's true, might the sound might you be able to harmonize the sound with that vibration? And that would also put you in some sort of a flow state, I would think, if you could harmonize all three of them. Yeah, and I often wonder if when we see things fluctuate and vibrate, if yeah. that isn't the natural state for also the reason that that's what physics says it is. They Actually, there is no fixed place right. of things, right? That's just all like a probability field. So maybe it's kind of hinting like, oh, it might be here. It might be a little bit over there. It might be slightly over here. Yeah. It's a weird, yeah. weird concept. Yeah. It, the more that I think about it, the more that that makes sense. Like, you know, when you, if we consider the default mode network, the way in which the brain operates, and then we take that offline, you're getting raw sensory data coming in. So why wouldn't you see things moving around instead of having that stabilization at the back of your brain turned on? We turn that off. Now you're just getting the raw feed coming in. So maybe those are the vibrations you're seeing. Maybe that's why you, when you, when you're on mushrooms, maybe that's obviously that's why you are taking stuff from the visual cortex and processing it in Broca's area, or you're processing, you know, sound in the visual cortex. So you are getting the raw data. At least it seems to me, I'm not, obviously I'm not a scientist. I am a huge fan of psychedelic drugs and I'm a huge fan of experimenting with psychedelic drugs, which brings me to this topic. I've recently been trying this experiment where if you're going to take mushrooms, I highly recommend taking like a, like HGH with it, like a human growth hormone with it. I've, I've found that it not only enhances the trip, it, it gives you at least to me subjectively. And I, I don't thoroughly know how to prove this. So it's all subjective, but I think it increases the overall sense of not only well being but it helps to strengthen those already new forming neural networks that you get by taking magic mushrooms. And what I mean by that to be clear is when you take magic mushrooms, you are building new processing pathways, new neural connections in your brain that don't normally work the way they do when you're not on mushrooms. And so if, if that is true, I think taking a, a natural, like a, like something like a MK677, which is a, uh, it's one of these, it's not a pro hormone, but it's a, uh, it's sort of like a pro hormone. I'll put it in the show notes down there. But when you take those two things together, I think it helps to continue to build those neural networks even stronger, faster, and longer lasting. So if anybody out there is, is a, a tinkerer or someone that is responsible and uses mushrooms, I would highly recommend trying it with a, uh, a human growth hormone, something that helps to, 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 to release that human growth hormone inside when you do it. It's, it's a pretty good experiment. That's real interesting. Uh, do you, what, what about the timing of it? Like when do you take one or the other? It's a great question. So I have found that, so, uh, I think it's called, okay. So yeah, it's, it's MK. So I'll put, I'll put the exact thing in there because it kind of bothers me that I can't think of the exact name of the stuff I'm taking. But I think it's MK677, but I'll get that down there. I have found that, according to my research, when you – growth hormone is secreted at nighttime. However, mm -hmm. this particular analog, it takes about an hour to kick in, and it's sublingual. So I'll take like maybe 15 milligrams, and I'll put it underneath my um, tongue, 
and you'll start to feel like a little bit of a bump, like a little bit of just feeling a little bit better, a little smoother. And then about two hours in, you might get kind of hungry. So I would say about a 15 to 30 minute onset before it gets into your bloodstream and anything you're going to tape sub sublingual, I think is, is relatively about 30 minutes. So, and the half-life on that is it's long. It's like, I think nine, 10 hours. So okay. you just need one dose. And I, I think that I, I take it about two hours before I'll take the mushrooms and I can, I can see a difference. If I look at my journal, I can see a difference between taking it earlier and later. If you take it past, you know, if you're taking a pretty good dose of mushrooms and then you take something an hour into it, it's very difficult to find out, you know, cause you're going to be, if you take something about three hours in, you're going to be peaking and you're like, ah, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on here. So I recommend taking it an hour before, maybe two hours before. I wonder if, if also simply fasting might have a similar effect. I would of, definitely you study fasting, right? It does, it does bump human growth hormone after 18 hours. 24 yeah. hours. Yeah. 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 I was just thinking fasting as a means of dieting to take it, but I, I didn't realize that fasting caused HGH to be secreted. Yeah. There's a really cool guy on YouTube that talks about fasting a lot. His name is Dr. Sten Ekberg. I've learned a lot from him and he, he goes through that in detail. And I think it's about the 18 hour mark of mm. fasting where HGH really starts to ramp up. It like doubles in production at least. So that maybe that plus, then you take that little bit and then, wow, that could be pretty good. Where do you get the, the oral HGH in the U S? Um, I was getting it from a site called science bio. However, oh, no prescription. you can just order it. Yeah. It's, um, so it's, it's a SARM, it's a selective androgen receptor and okay. they're kind of in a gray area for, for, um, supplements. There's clearly for anybody listening to this, like look up SARMs and like, I'm not giving advice for people to go do this or whatever, but yeah. it can be done. You know, I don't, I'm not saying you have to do this, but if you are going to do it, do your best research. They're called SARMs. I have found the bodybuilding community. If you go into a bodybuilding site, like those guys are the ultimate tinkerers and the ultimate people who are just telling you, I'm taking these 25 things. Here's what it looks like. And the bodybuilding community is hands down the most influential and the craziest and the strongest and the most knowledgeable when it comes to self hacking with supplements, at least in my opinion. And you can go yeah. on bodybuilding.com bodybuilding format and read posts and posts and forums of people. And they post their, I'm taking these five things, but SARMs is something the bodybuilding community has been taking for years. I think they're much safer than any kind of steroid. And if you look up SARMs, they're they're pretty much wide open. It's a gray market, so you would want to look for something with five stars or have someone recommend one to you. But yeah, there's no there's no need for prescription, and there's there's no need for um, going to a doctor or having anything like that. So they're readily available. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna look into that as well. Yeah, there. I think it's a great. I think it's. I think I was. You know, on LinkedIn, you can go and you can find all these people that are you know, starting to do these new studies. And on some levels, I think me talking about taking growth hormone with psychedelics would turn some people off. However, I, I do think that it would speed up the potential remedies for stuff like um, PTSD. And they're already having great they're seeing great progress with this stuff, but I think adding a growth hormone into that regimen would greatly increase the positive results that people, practitioners, and or tinkerers and self-hackers are having. Like, if you just read up on the literature on growth hormone, it's something that guys and women, they it's radically almost depleted out of your body by the age of 50. You know, it's such a small okay. amount you have. And it's just, it's it is almost like a wonder drug. So if you add that with the, the properties, uh, the healing properties of psilocybin, I think you're going to see a, a one, two punch and you'll be able to radically achieve that, which it is you're trying to achieve. At least it has for me. And I, I, I would recommend other people look into it and, you know, it can easily be done. They're doing all the studies with psilocybin and placebos. Why not just add a third category with you know, 15 milligrams of HGH in there. And, and if, you, if you're a, a John Hopkins, you don't need to take a, 
you know, you don't need to take a SARM that you got from bodybuilding.com. I'm pretty sure that you can just get a shot of something that was made at a lab in your hospital and you could monitor it. And it's probably going to help a lot of people. The, the company, the drug really, companies might not like it. The possibilities there for research are really exciting. Now that it's starting to open up and be a little bit more accepted to study these things. I, I'm excited for what they discover. You know, maybe it's an, another thing we haven't even heard about that even uh, has even better effects. Yeah, I think Hopefully so. They don't shut it down. Cause yeah, like there's, there's no money in it and that's a problem. Yeah. It's interesting to see, to see sort of the new battles taking part across old lines. And what I mean by that is, you know, it seems to me that in the past it was causing problems for, for, drug companies because they didn't really know how to make money from it. And you can still kind of see that today. Like you see some people trying to patent certain analogs or you see people trying to patent stuff like, Oh, this, I'm going to patent set and setting. You can't patent set and setting, but what do you see on the front lines of the psychedelic marketplace happening? What are some of the good things you see and some of maybe the fault lines? That can, you uh, see? can we come back to that? I'm going to switch Wi-Fi. I think. Absolutely. Hold on. All right, so we got Kevin coming back here, switching Wi-Fi a little bit. We're just talking about the different ways in which the psychedelic community has changed, what could be changing on the horizon, and what things are still the same about it. It seems to me that there are a lot of new battles being drawn. It seems to me that there is a whole lot of potential for positive outcomes coming up. There we go. I'm back. Sorry, I was on the wrong Wi-Fi, and at a certain hour, it gets it's shared, so it gets busy, and I forgot to put it on the other one, so I just had to switch. Should be good now. Yeah, no worries, man. No worries. We were just just talking about the possible pitfalls and the possible great opportunities coming from <clears throat> coming right. from the world of psychedelics. I hope they what don't do try think? to patent everything. Like every strain of psilocybin is going to be owned by Pfizer at some point. <laughs> <laughs> and you won't be able to get it anywhere. Well, I guess it's, as long as you can get it, I don't care that much. I just want people to have access to it. And yeah. if this is a fucked up way we go about doing it and having it distributed through somebody and they make more money on it and, and at least it becomes available. I don't know. I don't, I'm not happy with it, but it's better than the current scenario. Yeah, I agree. I've seen some interesting people talking about how, um, you know, I'm of the opinion that there's 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 two spheres of people. There's people that are really messed up. I think everybody could benefit from it. I, I think the majority of people could benefit from it. I think that there's people that have really deep-seated psychological problems. And then there's a lot of people that have a lot of other problems. But maybe there's a maybe there is a branch of people that need to sit down with a psychiatrist or a psychologist and have somebody there with them while they take it so that they don't hurt themselves, so they don't freak out. And, and maybe those people need to have someone with them every time they take it. But I think the majority of people should be taught maybe once you sit with somebody or maybe once you take it with somebody and you have someone explain, hey, here's, here's how I think about it or here's what I do about it or here's how I do it. Like someone should be shown the experience and then weaned off having someone be there because I think that the real work gets done when you're comfortable asking yourself difficult questions or you're comfortable confronting the questions that you're scared about. And I think that that's done by facing your own demons. So I'm, I'm worried about the way some people are patenting the process of like, okay, and you're going to take these mushrooms. You must come in, you must sit in this chair with these doctors and you must be here with these people. It's almost like they're trying to force down a form of 
a process. It's not so much, it's, it's they're trying to force you into this process. And when they force you into a process, they force you into seeing it a different way. What do you think about yeah. that? Well, I think that's one of the problems they have in the research as well is because they, they on the one hand, they know that the setting is super important. On the other hand, how do you, how do you research it without having a clinician type setting with doctors and coats and, and feeling like you're not at home, you know? So I think that's one of the challenges they haven't quite figured out is, is get the setting right to produce optimal results. And they've got really good results, but I think results would be even better if they allowed a person to choose their environment where they felt the most comfortable, like staying at home maybe and having the, the, the therapist come to their house and do it there. And I also agree that a lot of the, some of the deeper work has come when I've done it by myself, but depending on the, the psychedelic and the process we're talking about, there is a huge benefit to, yeah. to groups. And every time I've done ayahuasca, it's with groups. And I think there are multiple reasons for this. And the first one is that a lot of our healing or wounds comes from relationships. And therefore, a lot of the healing can also be found through relating with others. Mm -hmm. And I've had this experience every time I've been in an ayahuasca ceremony where after it's over, I got a lot of the insights from talking to other people there. Mm. And it just seemed like I always selected the right person to talk to. And that person had some experience or a point of view that related very directly to whatever I was dealing with. And I got a lot of benefit out of those interactions. And then a lot of the healing and learning would actually happen. At the ceremony itself, you don't really learn that much in ayahuasca. It's actually in the days and weeks that follow, because you have this heightened awareness and sensitivity to your, to your environment and to your people, that's when I actually got the most benefit out of it. So yeah, there's, there's definitely, I think both are, are valid, but I, I share the concern that you have in that they're going to say, no, it has to be this way. And they're, they're going to close themselves off again, as they tend to do when they get in that real specialized track. They sort of start ignoring the other angles. Yeah, that's a great point. I've, I've never done ayahuasca. I am. I've, I, I have both plants at my house and I've attempted to make it. I always try to make it on my birthday. However, my my ability to do so has not yet panned out. And I, I'm, ho I'm hoping it's like a. It's like making your own lightsaber. For in my mind, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do it when I can make it. But apparently, I don't have what it takes to make it yet. But when I do, that'll be when it's right to take for me. So, right. It's, inter it's interesting to think about how some of the revelations and healing has come from a group because it is the the group that maybe caused the trauma. Can you share maybe like one of the insights you got from somebody you spoke to after the ceremony? Well. Interestingly, what just came to mind is the last, I think this is the last time I, I did it, which was four years ago now. And I did it right after my wife left me, mm. like a week later. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, I was pretty raw. I mean, I think yeah. it ended in April and I went there May, May 6th or something. And it was three days. And um, after the last day, I was walking around the grounds and I walked to a stream or something and uh, I, this woman accompanied me and she said she said something like yeah she had some huge heartbreak um 10 years earlier and she said I realized in this weekend that I've closed myself off since then and I have not wanted to open myself up to anybody truly for over 10 years now and I've like I've just wasted all that time because I haven't done that. And I was like, oh, well, that's really good for me to hear right now. Yep. Because that's obviously something that a lot of people do when they go through a divorce or a bad breakup is they just wall themselves off and, you know, don't want to be hurt again. So that's just one example of just a random conversation I would have that applied directly to my scenario. Yeah. And especially in the state you were in of, of healing or being open to hearing suggestions, like that probably saved you 10 years of, of trying maybe. to figure out, you know, maybe two, maybe four, maybe even if it saved you like six months, it's incredible advice or maybe it saved you a lifetime. It's hard. It's hard to say. And it gets weird when you start thinking about how 
all of the things we see is one thing and that everything yeah. out there is really an extension of us. And then yeah. now you're having kind of this experience and then someone is like providing me the answer to a question, but it's coming from another person, but really it's me. So you go in this strange loop like that. It's kind of trippy. Yeah. Like who's to say that that wasn't part of the ayahuasca experience. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, or the I, world I, in general, the world is maybe all of the world is there to give you feedback. Yeah. It's all you, everybody you see, yeah. it's just a different version of you seeing itself in a different way. Right. The, I've heard a couple of different quotes that deal with like that. One of them was, God sees the world through your eyes. So show him a good time. Or yeah. I've heard, I've heard Alan Watts say stuff like he used to keep this picture of, or this statue of Shiva. And he said he would, every time he would go to the door, he would like look at this picture and start laughing. Cause he knew that every person that he sees is just himself seeing the other through a different set of eyes. And if you think about the world like that, if you think about your daughter or your friend or your wife or your coworker or, whoever it is, or the stranger on the street, that's just a different version of you. It's just a different version of the universe. Like you're all the same thing, having a different experience so that we can all learn what's happening out there. It's, it's a fascinating concept to think about, to kind of stretch your brain. Yeah. I was thinking the other day, something I read and they mentioned the idea that all of this is just for, for God's entertainment. So <laughs> insert whatever word you want replace God with the universe or yep. whatever you want to believe. But the idea there is that there's something that made this all exist and it's a perfect being with perfect knowledge and perfect information. What yeah. happens if you have perfect knowledge and perfect, perfect information? Well, you get bored because you yeah. always know all the time what's happening. So the only, the way that the creator solved this problem is by taking pieces of its consciousness and forming it into the imperfect being that is human. And then so the human goes around with its dramas and its emotions and its imperfect knowledge and thereby entertaining the creator through extension of its people that it made. I think that's yeah. kind of funny. To think about. Yeah. I, um, I, I think it's a, and the more you think about the idea, the more it expands and the more it helps you see the world. Like it actually helps you see, the world through other people's eyes it actually helps you have more empathy and and i think you can relate like if you can like you can't you probably can't understand what it's like to be another race but you can understand what it's like to go through trauma and then you can think to yourself this other person regardless of their gender or race has been through trauma and then you can mm -hmm. find that bridge of like well i bet you we both feel like this you know and it's just a good bridge to have and it's a good philosophy to see the world through. I got a, yep. I have another question here that says, do you feel that medical marijuana has the same effects as mushrooms? What do you think about that, Kevin? Definitely not. <laughs> yeah. But um, I don't want to discredit medical marijuana. I think marijuana is great too. Yeah. The closest you can get is with the edibles. Yeah. Um, and I'm real happy that that that's legal now in parts of the world because my experience with edibles before that I found that it's very difficult to get the dose right yeah and point. I usually got it wrong and took too much and while too much edible is still can be very insightful and profound it's also terrible it's, it's, <laughs> there's a lot of anxiety that comes and fear of death and things like that but now because it's legal, they can, they can dose it out and they can tell you exactly what's in each one. They've got different sizes. So you can start with a small one, try it out. And then it's a lot better for, for the user that way. So yeah, with, with those, you can have some pretty deep experiences that are close to, to a magic mushroom, I believe. Yeah. I've, I look at it like, like a journey and I, you know, if you just, if we get back to the nomenclature and the words we use, they talk, people talk about getting high. And if you think about all the drugs like f as like foothills next to a mountain, like I think when you're on mushrooms, like you're pretty high up on the peak and you're looking down and you're seeing a, this crazy view of things. And when you're when you eat when you eat uh, edible medical marijuana or if you just eat some weed or you smoke some weed, you're like on a different foothill, you know. So you're getting a different view 
You're still yeah. high. You're still seeing things from up above. You're still seeing a different angle, but it's not the same peak as this one over here. And that's probably the same with different, you know, I've never done ketamine, but I've done like ecstasy and tried some other types of drugs. And I think all of them provide you with a different view from a different foothill. You know, some of them have a sheer face. You look down, you're like, oh, dude, I don't want to even be here. You know, yeah. and there's other ones that have a nice rolling grassy hill and stuff like that. So I would say that medical marijuana does not have the same effects as mushrooms. And in, in, for me, in any way, shape or form, I've I've seen stuff out of the corner of my eyes. I'm been paranoid, but I've never had the hallucinations. Like I, I've never seen geometrical objects pop up in front of my open eyes on mushroom or on um when, when smoking weed or anything like that. But I do see those on this heavy mushroom trip. Yeah. yeah yeah that was i mean your analogy of the peaks is is pretty much a perfect analogy it's it's just different uh angles right yeah yeah so yeah. and you know in a, in a and way you, yeah go ahead man i was just gonna say that that takes us back to different us being part of of one organism the same way that different drugs provide us views from different peaks people with different points of view provide us with similar different views. You know what I mean by that? Like different peaks show you a different view. Other people's opinions of you show you a different view, but I had cut you off right there. What were you going to say? No, I was going to say anybody who's listening that wants to sort of to have this type of experience, but is afraid to try anything seriously, breath work, uh, holotropic breath work, try it out. It, it can, it's just profound. Um, the first, First time I went to it. So basically anyone who's not uh, aware of this, we talked about it before. Stan Groff invented it, patented the, the term or whatever, but you do it in pairs. So you have a sitter and a breather and each session is about three hours. And I went into this thinking, this is nothing like psychedelics. I'm going to be disappointed. So I was a, I was a sitter first. We did a coin flip. So my partner, his name was Jack. He was the breather. And so you just really just making sure that the person's okay, that they, you know, they don't need help or they have a nice experience. But that was sort of a trip in itself because while I was watching him, I got to see what else was happening in the room. And there were about 20 pairs of people, maybe 25. And there was a woman next to me. It wasn't even five minutes into the session. She started screaming at the top of her lungs like i'm serious like as if someone was stabbing her like screaming 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 and did it stop for over two hours that was her whole session and then i saw another guy like two people away going through this rage tantrum like yelling into his pillow screaming in his pillow punching it and then there was another person where two facilitators had to hold him down he was like his whole body was flailing all over the place violently they had to hold him down pretty much the whole time and this is the first time i've exposed to it and i'm like what the hell is going <laughs> on here right um they, yeah and they ended up you don't really talk to people about their issues it's not really that kind of like group therapy it's very much personal you share what you want to share so i didn't get to find out what exactly they were going through but it brought up all kinds of trauma for these people and not to scare anybody, I when I did it, I had an absolutely beautiful experience. I didn't experience any trauma, but you might. That's it's it's really it's really interesting. So check it out if you're all curious about that. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. I've heard about it, but I've never I have never experienced it. And you have a you have a class that the class that you do on breath work that you provide people that people can buy if they want. They. Is it, do you do some of the holotropic breathing or is it more the Wim mm -hmm. Hof and just kind of getting, getting the body ready for. To receive yeah. We don't, we don't go that. Yeah. We don't go that deep. It's pretty gentle. It's more just to, to relax and maybe boost your energy and just to feel more grounded. Um, it's only my, my class is more the yoga tradition. Anyway, we don't really do Wim Hof. It's just all the yoga pranayama. And I put into a course with like some physical techniques to warm up. And then it's also a 28 day meditation course built in it um the the, the weekly rhetoric is more wim hof because it's it's quick and it's effective but uh maybe in the future i'll, I'll do a longer one but for to do holotropic properly it's like a psychedelic you need set you need setting you need the right music you need people around you to help because if i had a group of 10 people and one of them's freaking out and flailing like i'm not gonna be able to to really help everybody so i need some helpers to 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 assist so that's more of a production yeah 
I wonder, have you, have you any experience with like hypnotism? Yes, a little bit. Ooh, um, I... Go ahead. Uh, apparently you have, right? No, I, I haven't. I was just talking about the psychedelic experience and talking about alternate states of consciousness and language. It just popped in my mind like, well, that's kind of an interesting side turn. So I thought I would just ask you. Yeah, um, not a lot, but I've been to some events and some workshops on. Oh, I think I lost you there for a second. Let's see. Well, let's see. Where are we at? We lost him here, ladies and gentlemen, but he'll be right back. Let's see if we can readjust this here. Yeah, see, so let's come here to settings. Yeah. All right, we lost him, but he'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. We were just getting to the idea of the way in which language can fundamentally change the way you think, be it your inner dialogue or be it the conversation you're having with other people. Have you ever had the experience where you sat down and you've had an incredible conversation and you leave that conversation feeling as if you're fulfilled, feeling as if you've accomplished something and having an all around good feeling about who you are and what just happened? I think that that stems from the words you use, the eye contact, and all the language that you use. Think about the way you express yourself to other people. Think about the way you talk about yourself in your own head. Like that is a form, in my opinion, that is a form of hypnosis. That is a form of changing the way, changing the world around okay. you, changing the entire yeah. way you see Sorry. the world. One no, of the... it's all right. Am I back? Well, this is the, the real major downfall of, of Bali is the internet. Like I just haven't found a great solution still over a year. It's just, I don't know. I wish well, I could take all the things that Bali has with good internet. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the problem with everywhere. You know, it's, it's 90% awesome and 10%, eh, what are you going to do? But yeah, my mom's got great in her house. I was loving it while I was there. Perfect. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's not Bali. You know, it's it's no. New York. <laughs> it's, not Bali. it's as far as from Bali you can get. <laughs> uh, I would what were we talking about? about this? We were talking about the 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 idea of hypnotism and experience with right. it. Right. Okay, so I don't have a lot of experience here. Just uh, I'll talk about what I have experienced. So one thing is that only um, like 80% of people can be hypnotized. So there's a certain percent that just no matter what, won't. Um, so that's why it's not as a solution for everybody. But I did some tests and it turns out I'm like medium hypnotizable. You want to rank it from one to 10, I'm like it's five or six. And we've done a few small things. Like there was, I don't know if I can demonstrate this, but um, this guy who took, so he, he started by drawing a circle like this. And then inside the circle, he drew a smaller circle. And then what he did is he put this flat on the table and he took a pencil or no, he took a paper clip and he dangled it from a string from his hand such that the paper clip was about center with the small circle. And then he'll, he'll have you hold this. So I was holding it. And then he, he started like, and he said from the beginning, he said, don't move your hand. So my hand is dangled above this thing, trying to keep it straight. And then he started talking to me. And the whole time I'm concentrating on my hand and trying not to move it. But he's giving me instructions to rotate it clockwise. Mm. And then after a few moments, it was rotating clockwise. But to my vision, my hand was not moving. Like I was trying so hard not to make it move and then he's like oh now it's rotating faster and then it went faster and he's like and now it's going the other way and now it's going the other way so like there was he was doing something to my mind against my will 
at that level because like I was doing what he was saying, although I was trying not to. And um, I'd also went to another workshop uh, with, I don't know if it's hypnosis or NLP, but there was a sort of, um, it was like teaching you how to get into a trance and induct people into a trance. And it's, uh, it's hard to explain it's similar to a deep meditative state and there are apparently language patterns that you can use yeah. to trigger that. And we, we did that. We, and we did it to each other with little to no, I was only a day workshop and he introduced it. And like by the afternoon, he, we were putting each other into trance with no ex prior experience. So it's something that anyone can do. Some people are better at it than others, but anyone can do it if you just follow this language pattern. And it's also about, it's about the language you use and, about the spacing of the words as well. So you have like a sort of hypnotic way to deliver it. And um, I found it fascinating. I, I know very little about it and I'm, I'm keen to learn more someday. It's on my, my bucket list to, to like do hypnosis training. It's very interesting. Yeah, I, I, I find it, I find it amazing too. Like when you, when you spoke about it like that, like I see a pattern and and perhaps that's what it is. If you if you choose to use a certain sequence of words in a certain pattern, then people will begin to follow the words you say. They can also do that with like video games, where or even some sort of media where they're flashing the light like a like a like white light, white light, white light, and they use their language at the same time as the light goes. It's a frequency following mechanism, and you fall into rhythm, and it. I believe that your language is almost like a heartbeat. That that's you ever heard that song "Staying Alive"? Dun dun dun. dun you like that? Staying alive, staying alive. Yeah, the Bee Gees. Yeah. So the, the bass drum, line. the bass line in there is the same as a heartbeat, and they theorize uh -huh. like that's why that's why that song hit number one so fast, and that's why it was so catchy. People didn't realize, but it was harmonizing with an adult heartbeat. And I think to this day, you can see different producers following that same beat. So it's most songs that are like that have some sort of, you know, rhythm to them that aligns with our body. And it, it's almost like a trance, the same way that drum circles can put you in a trance, the same way beats yeah, or dancing or yeah. dancing. Right. Yeah. It's almost like we're set up to be people that can be in a trance like that, especially in groups. It seems like. Yeah, that's a huge component of the of the Tantra school of, of spirituality is is trance and using dance actually to enter trance like states. Because again, it's not something I know a lot about, but I did I went to a four day Tantra festival and it had nothing to do with sex for you guys thinking you're an orgy. No, I wasn't in an orgy. <laughs> no, but uh there, there was like every day there was dancing. And that uh it's just fun. I mean, if, if you can get into it after a while, after a few minutes, the shyness goes away and you just sort of flowing with it it is you, your mind gets taken out of it of the equation after a time do you think that's what happened people, down at epstein island no i have a lot of things <laughs> going on epstein island. i don't know if we want to go into that <laughs> we can yeah um, what's, but it, yeah it's a big thing in in ubud the town of bali they've got what they call ecstatic mm. dance and it's not they have ecstatic dance all over the world but it's real popular here and they have it every friday and sunday and it's just like impossible to get tickets now. People love it. It's sold out a month in advance because they just, it's fun. I've been a few times. It's really good. Yeah. It seems like a different state and a different way to observe yourself and the people and the environment. It sounds like an awesome way to, to kind of decompress and get back to nature. Yeah. yeah. Primal. Yeah. And there's something to be said about that. You just come and you dance however you want. There's no, some people just don't even dance. They sit on the floor, they roll around, uh, you know, everything's cool. There's no talking, strict no talking mm. policy, no phones. Wow. Yeah. Man, that sounds like a, in some ways it kind of sounds like a rave. You know, if you take enough of something, you kind of can't talk. Drugs. Yeah. 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 And they say no drugs too. I don't know if people follow that, but you're not supposed to take any. Yeah. No drugs it's like its own drug. Yeah. 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 And it, like, it's fun, really. It sounds like it. What, um, yeah. let, let's talk about Epstein Island, man. What do you got on that? Anything good? What do you think? Uh, a piece, an interesting piece of information I have on it, which uh, I don't think I've seen discussed too, too extensively anywhere. Let's, let's hear so, it. So here's the background. 
we've discussed before about Freemasonry. Right. So there is a there's an organization that is I think derived from Freemasonry, but has no official or otherwise association links with Freemasonry. I forget the exact name. It's the abbreviation is OTO. It's called or something like Ordu Templis Ordentis. Right. Okay. Um, the only tie to Freemasonry that I could see about it, I did a little bit of research and I found this on Wikipedia, actually. It's not even right. a secret. So on Wikipedia, I was reading about OTO and they have a degrees system like Freemasonry does. And that seems to be the only connection to Freemasonry. So you enter and you have a certain title, maybe it's acolyte, and then there are maybe six or nine degrees. And then the next level is mystic. And then it's like supreme mystic or, or whatever. I forget what the titles are. But the higher levels, and this is according to Wikipedia, I don't know if this is true, yeah. but the higher levels of OTO are said to involve sexual techniques. And um, there's like specific like anal sex techniques is what you learn being a member of this organization. And to ascend this level, you have to drink a concoction of I don't know if it's semen mixed with period blood or something of that nature. It's like a male and female liquid energy that you, you mix in order to get to that level. All right. So that's all I know about OTO. This is the way it ties into Epstein. I heard on a podcast somewhere that on Epstein Island, there is a temple for OTO. And you can see this from the neighboring island. Apparently it's a big temple. And you can see it with your, your own eyes, all right? So there's an OTO temple allegedly on Epstein Island. Here's another thing that's interesting. Do you remember in 2016, the, um, the John Podesta emails yeah. for the Clinton campaign? Yep. Okay. So these emails were leaked from John Podesta, who was, I believe, Bill Clinton's chief of staff while he was president. And him and his brother had a, a firm that did dc beltway political consulting so when we found out that basically the democrats sabotaged bernie sanders in the democratic primary there was this hack of a lot of information and they got all the john podesta's emails in one of those emails they describe a ceremony that they held at their home that the clintons were i guess part of and the ceremony was hosted by a woman named Maria Abramovich, I think is her name. Mm -hmm. And they called the ceremony spirit cooking. And in this ceremony, they did similar things. Like they had, they had a, a, a vial of a liquid that was supposed to symbolize semen and menstrual blood. They had an exhibit of a baby covered in blood. And they had all these strange sort of quasi sexual demonic symbolism all throughout their house and they called this spirit cooking and it can't I remember it came out and nobody even denied it they're they're like hey clinton's podestas you're doing spirit cooking and they're like yeah we were i mean no big deal and of course they all have deep ties to epstein so you're like what the hell is going on with these people and i have no conclusion other than that i found that interesting yeah yeah, so I've read a little bit about OTO, and I, I think it was the Aleister Crowley back in the day. This guy was a uh, yeah, he, right. He called himself Satan himself, and and he's got some interesting ties to all kinds of government agencies. Along with him, part of his OTO, I forgot the. Um, it was a really incredibly intelligent forward thinking guy who came up with all kinds of technology. I want to say the Parsons, but I'm not Jack Parson. Maybe is that, or is that, that might've, I, I, I think it may have been something like that, but he took part in all of Aleister Crowley's quote unquote ceremonies. And the idea of OTO and drinking blood and, you know, the esoteric, spiritual calling up of demons and death and destruction. And this idea that I think Aleister Crowley's tagline was do what thou will regardless, because there's no good, there's no evil. There's only that which you will do. Yeah. I, it, 
do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. That's a yeah. philosophy of Telema, which I guess he invented. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, it's fascinating to think about what the heck people were doing. Even some of the Sabatini Frankists, which were, was a uh, offshoot of the Jewish religion, had a lot of interesting ideas about bringing forth powers from from beyond. You know, I don't know if they're dark or light, but there's there's just so much esoteric ideas about bringing into this world knowledge that is not from this world or that you can get from from spiritual highs. And there's all kinds of sex magic stories about people just doing all these crazy acts and like I I, I can see Alex all Jones that happening. <laughs> Yeah, how's that guy getting crushed for forty-five million dollars, man? No, no, I don't... they're just. I mean, I don't, not, I'm not fully in agreement with the law says, but you know, geez, you got to be able to let people talk, even if they want to say like it's your right to say crazy shit. But yeah. I feel like yeah, they're just. You know, I don't know why they want. I understand why they want to take him down, but I don't think it's it should be happening. It's the, not a good the, precedent. Yeah, like. And it just makes me think like the more that they try to kill him, the more that it makes me think he's right. Like if someone says something yeah, exactly. dumb or stupid, like who cares? Like that, no one believes that. But the fact you start targeting right. someone so hard. Yeah. yeah. There was some interesting stuff. Like the same I, thing with the censorship. Yeah. Like why do you need to censor it if it's not true? Yeah. I, th yeah. I think it was a, uh, there's a great book. Do I have it right here in front of me? I don't have it in front of me, but, uh, it's it's oh I do have it in front of me. It's right here. It's called uh I don't know if people can see this. It's called When Google Met WikiLeaks. Oh, I'm sorry. When yeah, when Google met WikiLeaks and it's the story of um the what's that guy's name? Who is the the CEO of Google? That guy's name is um gosh darn it, I can't uh, think of Schmidt. Name. Eric Schmidt. Eric Schmidt. Eric Schmidt goes to meet Julian Assange. In the um, Ecuador, was it Ecuador that first gave him safe harbor? In so. there? Yeah. Okay, so, so, so he goes over there to meet Julian Assange, and like, you know, they they have like the, it, there's so much. Everybody should pick up this book. It's really fun to read, and it's amazing, and it gives you insight. And it's written from Julian Assange's point of view, and like, it's just these two masterminds like battling in this game of chess, and you know, um, in one part of it they begin talking about censorship and, and um, the Google CEO was like, you know, Google is pretty much the world's mind and we have the ability, we're trying to make the world better. You know, we, we want, we have the ability to put out the information that needs to get out. And, you know, you may think it's censorship, but what we're doing, Julian, is the antithesis of what you're doing. Like you're causing problems and, you know, you, maybe you see this as censorship, but we see it as strength. And Julian Assange just tells him like, well, see, this is the difference between guys like me and guys like you. See, you think that censorship and you think that putting the right words out there is a sign of strength. But anybody who knows anything, and he said it like, the way I read it was like super condescending. Like he just crushed him. He's like, well, you see, censorship is actually like a really, f is, a, is a form that I celebrate. He's like, I'm glad that you're censoring people. That shows me how weak you are. Like that shows me how sad Google is that they can't even have a dissenting voice because they're so afraid they'll be crushed. Like I'm nobody. My organization is nothing. You just told me you pretty much rule the world. And then in the next sentence, you showed me how scared you were by talking about censorship. And he goes on to talk about how people should be thankful that there's censorship because that truly shows that the people in positions of authority are weak and they're cowards and that they're so fragile that anybody can hurt them. And that's why they must censor them. You know, and it was it was like an idea I had never heard about when he just started talking about celebrating censorship and that it means you've almost cracked the very foundation on which the power structure exists. And I was like, dude, Julian Assange is amazing. Like, listen to this guy. And then there's another guy that's being persecuted, like Alex or like any sort of truth teller. Like, it just goes to back up what he said. That's how afraid they are. Like, I guess we should... I should try to give you an example of who I think they are. I would say that the existing power structure, like the Atlantic Council, the World Economic Forum, the Council on Foreign Relations, you know, the heads 
the CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies, the people that make decisions regardless of which nation state they claim to be from, the people, the interlocking boards of directors, the people that own all the important land and have all the important decisions, like they are in a position where they can be taken down by an organization like WikiLeaks. And that's why you see someone being so, like, it's weird to see such a political prisoner in today's day and age. You know, it's, it's, it's mind blowing to me. Yeah. Um, it was disappointing when it was disappointing to me when, when uh, Trump didn't pardon them Yeah, because Trump had this thing like, Oh, I'm going to take down the, the, the deep state and stuff like that. And uh, I don't know. I don't necessarily like him, but I like that idea. And he had a golden opportunity to do something there. He could have pardoned both of them and he didn't take it. So I don't know. I think that's a key. That's like an important for the U.S. An important topic of discussion, especially a guy like Snowden, where he's doing, like he's he's showing you what's really happening behind the scenes, and we're not supposed to know that, obviously. And there's just this. I this. It's still uh, the left talks about it a lot the patriarchy. There still is this patriarchy, right? There's there's a people that think they should have the information and no one else should. And um, to some extent, I agree with that sentiment. There's a lot of on the left I don't agree with, but I do agree with the sentiment that there we need to do something about these power structures. Yeah. And I don't know what the answer is because you're not going to change the structure from within. <laughs> so what options do you, do you have left? Like none of them are good. I think that's where we find ourselves right now. I think that the world as we know it, I think that the majority of people are operating under the idea that we live in a nation state, but that's, that's not really the case. Like I, I think that the city you live in is like its own little kingdom, you know, that you've seen the birth of these so-called city states, like San Francisco is its own state. New York is its own state. Hawaii is its own power structure. And this idea that we're one, I'll just speak specifically of the United States. This idea that we are a nation it sounds good to people, and kids have been taught that their whole life, but that's not the way it operates. Like it, there's no, nothing really holding us together except the belief that we are together. And the the monetary system has begun to fail. And so you're just seeing people print. The only answer is to print more money. The only answer is to throw money at the problem now. And yeah. I think people in positions of authority go like, look, we can't keep doing this. And other people are like, well, that's our only option. What else are we going to do? And, and you know, you're seeing it. And, and that's why there's this divide. That's why there's BLM versus the white Christians. And that's why there's gay versus straight. Like That's why the propaganda is so heavy on division because God forbid people see it as the patriarchy or the 1% or the ruling class, however you want to say those terms there's us and there's them and them yeah. are scared that's what i think is going on and that's why alex jones is getting crushed julian assange is getting crushed baron brown is getting crushed like edward snowden's getting crushed like all these people represent different sectors of our planet but they're all preaching the same thing like hey it's this small group up here that's stealing everything from everybody and they don't want you to know about it yeah it seems um, taking a huge timeline, looking at the timeline of humanity, it seems to be the main problem or the main challenge seems to be how do we expand the in-group while maintaining sovereignty on a personal level? Because that's, you touched on it, like all of our conflicts are us versus them. Yep. And there's this idea going out there that we need to abolish the nation state so that we have humanity as a human on a human level and we don't identify ourselves with this country or that country we're all people we're all humanity so how do we expand the in-group to encompass all humanity and all beliefs without what i view as would be a very oppressive regime at the top of that controlling the world how do we get the leaders the authorities into that same in-group that seems to be the the major challenge for for humans because yeah, as long as we have a, a leadership, that would, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I got a couple of thoughts on that. And 
I want to share an exercise that I do in my mind because sometimes I find myself going down this road of us and them, and I know it's not healthy. So what I what I always do for myself is I'll start thinking like, oh, it's these guys that do it. You know what? It's these guys have all the money, they got all the power, probably come from a rich family. They've had everything given to them. You know, I just go down this rabbit hole of like making excuses. And then I think about me and I'm like, well, you know what? I'm the guy that has all the money. I, if, if I compared myself to someone in the third world, I would be the guy I'm complaining about. So it does me yeah. no real good to complain about these people when in fact I'm that person. So that kind of pulls me back from the us and them argument. And I, I look at us in a transition period and maybe this happens all the time. And maybe this is the point societies get to before they either fall or they take the next step. And it seems to me we're seeing signs of the next step. And that next step is decentralization. And it's not perfect. It's messy. And there's winners and there's losers. But it at least allows for a meritocracy. It, it, at least it allows for a more merit-based idea of moving up the ladder. When there's no mobility, there is destruction. And it seems to me that what's been happening since the world has become industrialized is that we have changed men and women's birthrights. The birthright to learn, work hard, and get lucky and move up the social ladder. Like that's everyone's birthright, regardless of what color, what race, what gender, regardless of where you're born at. If you work hard, you study, you sacrifice, and you get lucky, you should be able to move up high in the position of status because you're providing more value. You've sacrificed, you've worked hard. However, that's not the case. Now there is there is this idea that your consumption habits define who you are. It's not how hard you work. It's not what you've studied. It's not what you're teaching. It's not what you value. It's purely your consumption habits that attribute to you your level of success. And what I mean by that is there can be some, like look at Paris Hilton's brother. Like this guy's, I don't know him, but he seems to me to be a dummy, like a big dummy who has all kinds of stuff. But guess what? He's got billions of dollars. So he automatically has the status that that money lends him. Those are your consumption habits. He did nothing to earn that. He did nothing to get it. He was born with it. And I think if we can get to a world of decentralization, we get away from our consumption habits being that which lends us our place in the world. Like consumption habits is exactly what the foundation of capitalism and our world is based on. The more you consume, the more power you appear to have or the more actual power you have because you can buy things. But it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily correlate to who you are or what you are. And that gap, that's the wealth gap. The wealth gap is consumption. And consumption is a very poor driver and a very poor explanatory force of who we are. So I think we're getting, I think decentralization gets us away from the consumption patterns that define us. So I think that's how we do it. How about that? I think that's one pillar. Okay. What else I'll you got? I'll propose another pillar. Please. The uh, um, spiritual awakening on a mass scale. Because yeah. all the things we talked about, the in and the out group, that's just ego. That's the yeah. persona. I identify with this belief system. I identify with this country or that country. So as long as we have that, we're always going to have divide. And unfortunately, the powers, they play on this all the time. Yep. So it's up to, no one's going to do this for us. No one's going to do it for you or for me. It's our individual goal to, I mean, it's a hard path, like to, to try to deconstruct your ego and start and stop identifying with all of the little things that define you, the character that is George or the character that is Kevin. I mean, it takes a lot of work, but I think that's the only way we're going to see things in a more unified way without the constant us, us and theming of everything. I don't know how to do it without people putting the work other than dosing everybody with LSD at once. <laughs> <laughs> I, or the I, aliens, the aliens come and then we're at a different out group. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I think that the East and West each have a part to play. You know, I, I, I do 
I think maybe the, you know, sometimes when I think of aliens, I think we're the aliens and like, we, we just don't recognize ourselves, you know, Could wouldn't be. it be right? Like you mentioned it last time you had that vision. Yeah. Like I, I really think that there's something there. Like just think about the word alien and the concept of alien. Like it's, it's something that you can't recognize. It doesn't necessarily have to be out of this world. And then isn't it weird how like we describe like, aliens out of this world but then we also describe like a mushroom like whoa man it's out of this world you know like or an illegal alien that's an illegally acceptable term for a foreigner <laughs> an illegal alien <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's so funny i yeah. mean in in some ways it's really funny to me like some yeah. forms still have that some legal form like uh, alien they ask you for your alien status yeah martian oh martian yeah, yeah. Not like human. i what do you have you ever heard this idea of technology as the alien? Are you familiar with that? No, please uh, explain it. Okay, so there's this there's this idea that technology itself is the alien. And if you think about technology in let's say the 40s, like a computer took up a whole warehouse. It was this giant vacuum tubes and you know, it was this it was technology. It was this alien thing that had come to get to know us. And we began to study this alien and we had it in a big cement box and we figured this thing, we're playing with it. And over the years, the alien is slowly like consuming us. It's trying to get into us. It's like a parasite in a way. So, you know, that we go from the huge vacuum tube and the, in the concrete box in the Pentagon to like, Hey, I'm a little friendlier. Now I'm going to sit right on your desk. Now I'm pretty close to you. You know, you start interfacing with it. You're like, oh, this thing's pretty cool. I really like the way it, this thing helps me think a little bit different. Hey, this helps me see things different. And then a few years go by and you're like, hey, you know what? I got this I got this cool phone in my hand, a little smaller. It's in my pocket now. Now it's it went from a warehouse to the desk to my pocket. And now it's like hmm. I pull it out. And pretty soon, now I got what now I got what we call wearables. Now you have this little thing on your wrist. Hey, buddy, how's it going? You know? And all of a sudden, now there's like, hey, man, just take this pill and it'll tell the hospital when you have a little problem with your vein, you know, and there's Lord knows what's in the, you know, there's all this talk about there being graphene or there being certain things inside the the vaccines or there's all this talk about people getting a chip in you, you know, and like you can make the case that technology or look at look at Neuralink. They want to put this thing inside your brain like the technology has gone from this animal, because you could call it an animal if you were to use a, a fun metaphor. Look at this giant animal that we put in a cage and we're slowly getting it toward, it's, it's almost like it's consuming us. And we think about that terminology again, how much time do your kids spend online consuming information? You know, it's, it's like the information becomes us. And so, you know, I, I think that maybe Philip K. Dick had some ideas about technology as an alien or, you know, and, and why not? Like, look at the foundation of the movie, The Transformers, how like the all spark comes here, you know, and it's not like the idea hasn't been in the mind of science fiction writers before, which is, you know, you could argue that science fiction writers are the the modern day fortune tellers who are writing the future. You know, it's so it's an interesting idea to think about technology as an alien and and. You know, there's what about like all the UFOs inside crazy pictures of like the Renaissance pictures? You know, like the idea of technology has been around for a while. I, yeah, the theory that the, the Ark of the Covenant was alien technology, right? You've heard that one? No, I haven't heard that one. Please share that with me. No, I mean, I don't know much more than what I just said, but like there, there's that theory that the Ark, the, I guess in the, in the Ark, people, if, if they were near it, they would yeah. get sick or something they had problems yeah. and so the theory is that was actually some kind of radioactive alien technology and there's yeah. a place uh grant ha graham hancock talks about this he, he said that he tried to find modern the modern trail of where the ark could be or could have gone and he tracked it to a church in ethiopia that practice that practices ancient christianity that claimed to have the ark and they're all blind and they don't let you they don't let you in to see it wow so it is some some radiation that fell from the sky um and maybe we actually benefited from that thing maybe maybe we did get visited tens of thousands of years ago by aliens and they gave us some technology i mean it's all in the realm of possibility
Yeah. I was just at a funny thought earlier when you talk about the AI, where like the more you start questioning and open your eyes to stuff, the more that the people you thought were previously crazy now start to make sense. Like I was thinking, hey, you know that guy, the Unabomber? Maybe he had a point. Or like <laughs> the the people, the Waco, the, the Waco incident where they just tried to do an autonomous community, you know? Yeah. Portrayed as villains and got, and got killed. But hey, maybe they just want to form their own mini state apart from society. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And all of those people were demonized. All of those people were taken out. Like, like why take out the crazy people? If you're gonna take out if you're gonna take out the the um the Waco people, why you take out the Mormons? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what's it like? How come one cult wins in this one? <laughs> Yeah, right. It's yeah. like what what were those people doing? You know, I they had some ideas that were potentially dangerous to the power mm -hmm. structure, and they had to be removed. I like I'm a huge fan. Like technological slavery for people that are um, curious about Ted Kaczynski's work, it'll blow your mind, man. It reads like that guy called the future. He's let me you know what I think. I have an excerpt I can. I can just read real quickly that we're probably I didn't realize you made a shirt for your podcast. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks man. I'll send you one. Yeah. It's got the, it's got the monkey. It's like, it's a monkey holding a human skull. <laughs> oh, I like it. I, I, hmm, awesome. What's going on here? You know, I, I often wondered, I've, I haven't gone back to research the people that Kaczynski was sending letters to, you know, I, I know that he was sending. There were professors and stuff, right? Like technology professors. I think so. Somehow. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he goes on to talk about how the modern, okay, this was, this book was written in like 2000, but I think he got in trouble in the nineties is when that happened, when the Unabomber manifesto came out and, and when he was finally rounded up, turned in by his brother. But, uh, Oh, man, like there's just, just so much in here. Like, okay, here's just a quick insert. He talks about, here's an illustration of the way in which the over-socialized leftist shows his real attachment to the conventional attitudes of our society while pretending to be in rebellion against it. Many leftists push for affirmative action, for moving black people into high prestige jobs for improved education in black schools and more money for such schools. The way of life of the black underclass they regard as a social disgrace. And if you remember Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton talking about black people as super predators, if you remember, Ad, not Admiral Byrd, but uh, Senator Byrd was like a member of like the KKK. And like, that's who Joe Biden was at. Like that guy's, that guy's, gave the eulogy for that guy's, you know, when he died and stuff like to think that institutional racism doesn't exist is crazy. So this is what Ted Kaczynski says about the, the leftist paradigm. He says they want to integrate minorities into the system, make them business executives, lawyers, scientists, just like the upper middle class. The leftists will reply that the last thing they want to do is to make the minorities into a copy of the white man, but that's exactly what they're trying to do. And then he gets into like over socialization. He gets into the revive, like the the industrial society and its future. It, it, it basically talks about the idea of slavery when throughout the world, be it not just the United States, but in Greek times, just this idea of slavery, about there being a permanent underclass of people. And the best way to do that is not to divide people along lines of race or gender or anything like that is to create a permanent underclass where there's a handful of people at the very top that will rule everything. And like he gets into this, you know, in like the nineties, he goes, technology is the way they're going to do it. He's like, you can already see the way technology is just dividing people. And like, he wrote about almost everything that's happening that that's happening right now. He's like, this is what's going to happen. And so while some of his stuff, is for is pretty far out there. And you know, I, I don't condone anybody sending letters to people and bombing them and trying to kill them. If you read the literature that he wrote, it makes incredible sense to get to the ideas that he got to. Like 
yeah, this guy saw what was happening. This guy was a mathematician from Harvard. This guy was at the cutting edge of creating policies. And he was like, dude, I'm not going to do it anymore. This is horrible. We're not, we should never do this to anybody. Like, uh, I, I highly recommend everybody pick up this book. It's called technological slavery. And the first part is the Unabomber manifesto. And I don't want to be a guy that's celebrating lunatics. Violence. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to celebrate violence. But I, I think there's something to be said about the people that the system goes after wholeheartedly. Like there's a reason they're going after them. And it it might be because they're a lunatic, but it, there might be some nuggets of truth in what these people are doing that people should pay attention to so that they don't get wiped away from history. You know, like a you, you look at I mean, there was a bunch. There used to be this lunatic that was like, hey, man, we're not the center of the universe, man. You guys are all, you know, a lot of lunatics have good points. They're just ahead of their time. Now, some people are just lunatics, but the the the, the book is called Technological Slavery. People should read it. It's fascinating. I I couldn't. Does recommend it talk it. about MK Ultra at all? Um, it doesn't really go into. It doesn't really go too much into that. But there, he gets interviewed. The back half of the book is like um. He there was a psychologist that befriended him while he was in prison and he started writing letters to him. And for like the first five years, Kaczynski didn't even he's like, dude, I'm not gonna, I'm not talking to anybody, man. But this guy kind of befriended him and um and, and he ends up the, the psychologist uh printed all the letters and Kaczynski and the psychologist printed all the letters in there at the end of the book, and it talks about you know, um let me see if I, I can they're all here's here's a here's like another little excerpt i'll give you guys are you doing okay on time yeah i got about uh 15 20 minutes and then i gotta take off okay let me just read this one little excerpt right here you ask is it not possible that our culture's unhappiness stems from our lack of strong religious beliefs not our industrial lifestyle undoubtedly some people are happier for having strong religious beliefs on the other hand, I don't think that strong religious belief is a prerequisite for happiness. Whether religion is usually conducive to happiness is open to argument. But the point I want to make here is that the decline of religion in modern society is not an accident. It is a necessary result of technological process. Just think about that for a minute. The mm -hmm. end, right, it, it is a necessary result of technological process. There are several reasons for this, of which I will mention three. First, Every curtain science pulls away is another that God cannot hide behind. In other words, as science advances, it disappears. It disproves more and more traditional religious beliefs and therefore undermines faith. Second, the need for toleration is antagonistic to strong religious belief. Various features of modern society, such as easy long distance transportation, make mixing of populations inevitable. Today, people of different ethnic groups and different religions have to live and work side by side. In order to avoid the disruptive conflicts to which religious hatred would give rise, society has to teach us to be tolerant. But toleration entails a weakening of religious faith. If you unquestionably believed that your own creed were absolutely right, then you would also have to believe that every creed that disagreed with it was absolutely wrong. And this would imply a certain level of intolerance. In order to believe that all religions are just as good as yours, you have to have, deep in your heart, considerable uncertainty about the truth of your own religion. Third, of all the great world religions teach us such virtues as reverence and self-restraint. But the economists tell us that our economic health depends on a high level of consumption. To get us to consume, advertisers must offer us all endless pleasure. They must encourage unbridled hedonism. And this undermines religious qualities like reverence and self-restraint. So, yeah, that's – I mean the guy yeah. the guy had some things figured out. But you know what? Yeah, I had some – right A lot, man. And I, I, it, it's pretty fascinating to think about. But, again, I have a couple – I had another question that was, that was asking you – what does it say? It said, how was – here, I'll put it right here so you can read it. Oh, he's still with us, brother. Cool. Yeah. How was he able to get away from his job? Did he just walk away? That's. I guess this is hearkening back to an earlier part of our conversation when you said that you had, in the beginning, you had spoken about your oh. book. And 
So what did you do to get away from that? Was I'm sure that wasn't an easy move. I simply left. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I would give everyone that advice. Um, it's usually better to have something lined up because the uncertainty of, uh, of not knowing the next thing is a hard thing to deal with uh, for me too, but in general, but yeah, I just, I just left everything. And most recently I even left my country and everything. I just, I was living in Switzerland, uh, left my apartment, left the country, left the job, just walked away. Um, I had some savings, which uh, obviously made it easier because I've been working a, a high paying job for the last maybe six, five, six years. So I put away, I, I'm, I'm not a big spender. I don't have a lot of needs. You know, I, I don't really buy much. I was, didn't have my own apartment. I was sharing a lot of the time. So I didn't have like high rental costs. So yeah, I've just, I just managed to, to put away a decent amount of money. Not that I can retire off of it, but enough to uh to bridge whatever this transition that i'm currently in uh will be so i think i'm I'm okay for a little bit and i also live in a cheap country so i moved to bali where for a thousand dollars a month i have this kick-ass lifestyle i mean i mean i never cook i never clean i get massages every week i go to the gym like do little trips all the time that's for for a thousand bucks you can live pretty pretty damn well so that, that's what I'm doing. And if I ever need to really ratchet down the spending, I could I could live off probably five or six hundred a month if I had to. So on on your cool. site, Kevin, you do you do a lot of coaching. You've got um, resources available to you. I think you're even you have a, a free consultation people can can do if they come out yep. to your site. So for yeah, my friend can... True Patriots right here, if he wanted to reach out to you, I'll put the links below. So True Patriot, if you I'll put the links below, you can Go to Kevin's site and you can schedule a consultation with him and he could probably, you know, talk to you and, and figure out if, if you're whatever you need to talk about. Yeah. And a lot of people, they're fine with just the one, you know, we have one yeah. session, a the free session. And then, you know, in that session, we'll probably figure out you know, what you want to do and then maybe get kind of a rough action plan. We just we don't follow up. It's just it will be up to you to, to follow through with everything. Yeah. Most people get what they need out of just one a lot of the time. Yeah, that's sometimes you need someone who has been down the path before just to, hey, man, watch out for that dog leg on the back nine over there or whatever. Yeah, right. Yeah. And that's enough. So that's it. So, yeah, book is kevinholtbook.com. Website is kevinholt.me. And on the first page, there's a link to my online booking thing. Nice. Well, fantastic. Yeah, so, question. yeah. So um, that's what we got, man. It was, I really enjoy the conversations and I feel like the time flies by and um, oh. I'm really yeah. thankful for, for getting to getting to hang out with you and learn from you and have a fun conversation that I, I'm hopeful other people will take away some, some good nuggets from. So once again, Likewise, can, my yeah, enjoy once it. again, what people can, what's the name of your website again? Where, they can, where can people find you? Uh, Kevin Holt me. And the same site will link to the, the book, uh, the book page is kevinholtbook.com and i don't have the link but somewhere in my linkedin profile there's a link for the the breathwork group for those of you that are interested in that it's on telegram though you need the telegram app fantastic all right kevin well i really appreciate it and we'll talk again next week man we'll do it all right thanks brother okay have man one. have a good one yep aloha yeah.